Would you raise your hands if you know someone who's committed suicide? It's become almost normal. Young people are copying each other. 25% of climate change is the result of animal agriculture. 85% of rainforest deforestation is the result of animal agriculture. When things are not going well with the economy, we have one of our presidents saying, like, go out and shop. That is just Looney Tunes. I think it's time that we tell stories about things that matter. We don't have to live this way. Things don't have to be the way they've always been. I'm going to be bold and say this can be the voice of this generation. I want to live in a world where my son will not be presumed guilty the moment he is born. The last thing I did was create the Malala Fund with the youngest Nobel Peace Prize winner, Malala. I'm the grandson of Jacques Cousteau, environmental activist, filmmaker, social entrepreneur and author. I'm a singer-songwriter. I was part of the United Nations campaign to end violence against women. I'm currently studying the intersection of race, education, incarceration at Harvard University. I started Gender Proud, advocating for transgender rights. I founded the Thirst Project, which today is the world's largest youth water activism organization. What is the show about? But inspiring other people to aspire. So I've been working for a while now to bring educational access to girls in the poorest parts of the world. And there's a lot of really dark stuff that I've seen. Probably the most heartbreaking has been the suicide epidemic. I went to a Native American reservation in South Dakota, and it's ground zero for the epidemic. So we know that suicide is the leading cause of death for young girls globally now, and we think of this as a problem that's taking place elsewhere, far away. But I was shocked to learn that here in Pine Ridge, girls are committing suicide at 10 times the national average rate. While the poverty rates around Pine Ridge are incredibly high, with up to 80 to 90 percent unemployment, and life expectancy here is 48 for men, 52 for women. That's the second lowest in the entire Western Hemisphere. But there are depressed places all over the world. Why are so many kids killing themselves here? To find out, I went to one of the reservation's teen suicide prevention programs. It's called Sweetgrass, and it's a refuge for kids in danger of falling victim to what's become an epidemic. Would you raise your hands if you know someone who's committed suicide? More than one person? More than two? More than three? More than four? More than five? More than six? More than seven? More than eight? More than nine? More than 10? 11? 12? 13? 14? 15? 16, 17, 18. And this is just this last year. In a row. Yeah. It's become almost normal. Young people are copying each other. On the walls of the school, signs of crisis. People don't get that depression's a sickness. And I, had, I, was, I thought I had the best life in the world. And one day depression just hit me told me I'm worthless, I'm not meant to be here. So I went to his house, and then I walked to his closet and I opened the door, the closet, and I said, what is this doing here? He said, it's my rope. I'm going to the park to find a tree. I said, I'm going with you, because you know what? That tree where you're gonna hang your rope doesn't want that rope on his tree. Don't let that tree take your life because the tree brings so much. <laughs> when people call the suicide hotline, it's grandma who answers. The Ogallala Sioux tribe, we're leading in the number of suicide completions. And how many calls a week are you getting? We can average about seven to 10 calls a day. Why do you think suicide has become so common here? Uh, it's a way out. It's a way they out. they it's left, so why can't I? A way out of what? A way yes. out of life, like hard, 
just hard decisions. My dad beat my mom up and they took my dad to jail. I have no food to eat. Um, I got raped. Suicide is so prevalent here that there is now a counter movement growing in the schools. Kids banding together into ad hoc support groups with the goal of understanding the roots of this epidemic. We look back on our generations and look back on our ancestors and they were so strong and powerful and they did all these wonderful things, but we were forced onto reservations and now we are the ones who are living with the consequences because we're all so mad that we're here. It's about trying to find ourselves again within our Lakota culture because that's who we are. Every 40 seconds across the globe, somebody dies by suicide. But the good news is, suicide is absolutely preventable. So we at Columbia developed a protocol. It's a few questions that actually helps figure out who's at risk for trying to take their lives. It's been working extremely well. Just across one state, they reduced their suicide rate by 65% in 10 months. So the tools to cut suicide rates in half already exist. But implementing those tools takes time and money, both of which are running out at the Pine Ridge Reservation. I'm the person that has answered to over 300 calls in, in one year is being defunded. So all the hard work that we tell these young kids to reach out for help, then I'm gonna shut the door on them. Life matters, but yet our program is coming to an end. Wow, that was really heavy. It's crazy. The heart on, on, on her to just do the work. Yeah, she is the first responder and keeps track of young people who say things like, you miss me when I'm gone. And those are the signs that she picks up on. Who are the young people who need someone to reach out to them and say, you're not alone, you matter. For me as someone who wants to be very actionable and say, well, my gosh, like, there's all this suffering. What can we do? What can I do? So what we've done is set up a CrowdRise campaign so that she can keep working and her youth advocates can keep working to fight youth suicide. In today's digital world, you could have thousands of Facebook friends, but still not feel close to any of them. It can actually be pretty isolating. But what if we could leverage the power of technology to actually make you feel less isolated? That sounds powerful. Let's check it out. My name is Nancy Lublin, and I'm the founder and CEO of Crisis Text Line. Crisis Text Line is essentially a tech startup. The difference is we're not helping you like taxi. find a taxi in the rain or order Chinese food at 2 o'clock in the morning. Crisis Text Line is 24-7 free support for people in crisis by text. We thought it would be all bullying and calculus exam problems, but it's majority suicide and depression, anxiety, and family issues. It's bad out there. Crisis Text Line works just like you would text your mom or your best friend, except these are trained crisis counselors. We're able to help texters tip to a healthy decision. In just over two years, we've processed over 11 million texts. If you or someone you know is in crisis and needs support, please text us, and the number is 741-741. It makes a line up your phone. Crisis text line. 25% of climate change is the result of animal agriculture. 85% of rainforest deforestation is the result of animal agriculture. Today, we're in Corona, Queens, visiting uh, some children at a uh, school. A lot of these children, I've never seen a dentist before or haven't been to the dentist as much as they should be. So we try to make it a very pleasant experience for them. Okay, guys, so we're going to be doing call day today. We are at PS19, one of the largest elementary schools in the United States, and the average student doesn't own their own toothbrush. That's a red flag. So, Doc, they said about 250 children today. Okay. You good? I think so. Right, now all we need is children.
The program is Colgate's Bright Smiles, Bright Futures. It is an outreach program that Colgate has instituted to bring dental awareness to the inner cities. Nervous? No. Nope. I'm a little nervous. We have seen children who say they did not have a toothbrush or that they share toothbrushes, and we're able to provide that to them. Okay, we're going to give you a new toothbrush today. The kids get to be with the dentist and learn about their teeth, and they really just get to see that, that they don't have to be afraid of the dentist. We identify serious problems. Does tooth ever hurt you? And when we identify serious problems, we can refer them where they can be taken care of. You got a good report card? Yeah. All right, good job. Can I see some smiles? <laughs> We're checking to see if their hygiene is good. We're checking to see if they need ortho consultation, and we're basically just taking a look at their teeth. I've been with the program for many, many years, and I'm surprised that so many children have never been to a dental office. So it's important to keep your teeth healthy so you can have a big, beautiful smile like I do, okay? He asks you if you've been brushing every single day, but you have to be honest with you. I hope you do this again. Okay, pretty good job. I know all of us can agree that you know, the choices we make every day have consequences. And one choice in particular, what we eat, has particular impact on the world around us. Moby is one of the best-selling electronic music artists in history that he's dedicated his life to the issue of food and particularly farming. I never expected to actually have a career as a musician. Growing up in and around New York, I was involved in like the house music world and the hip hop music world. And somehow I ended up with a record contract. I thought I was gonna spend my whole life teaching philosophy at community college. So almost every aspect of the career that I've had has been a complete surprise. My approach to animal welfare, I wouldn't say it's in keeping with any spiritual dogma. I would say that I'm a quantum mechanics loving Taoist, Buddhist, lover of Christ, Sufi. When I was 10 years old, I found a tiny baby cat in the dump. I was looking at this cat and I realized the cat had two eyes, four legs, fur, and a profoundly rich emotional life. That's when I decided that I could no longer be involved in any process that contributed to animal suffering, so that's when I became a vegan. People make the argument that it's perfectly natural for humans to eat animals, and I would say that to a large extent, physiologically, you're right, but we have created a world where nothing is natural. There are a lot of people out there who are committed meat eaters who are profoundly offended by factory farms. You have these super sick cows and pigs and chickens forced to stand around in their own feces, and the only way they're kept alive is by being fed tons of antibiotics. So the result of that is that you have these super bugs, these bacteria that don't respond to antibiotics. Now you have kids going to hospitals who are dying of bacterial infections because we've created these super bugs on factory farms. 25% of climate change is the result of animal agriculture. 85% of rainforest deforestation is a result of animal agriculture. Probably 60% of diabetes, 50% of heart disease, 40% of California's water goes to animal agriculture. So we're here at my new restaurant, Little Pine. It's 100% organic, 100% vegan, and just opened recently here in Los Angeles, California. When I was 15, 16, 17, and I was very involved in the hardcore punk world, and part of the hardcore punk world was confrontation. So when I became a vegan, I started militantly, aggressively confronting people with my veganism. And the only thing that resulted from that was that I annoyed my friends. So I learned that if you want people to actually consider what you're saying, screaming at them is not the most effective way of communicating. As humans, we have choice. And I feel like if we're given a choice between one action that causes suffering and one action that doesn't cause suffering, it just makes sense to choose the action that doesn't cause suffering. 
thoughts, reactions? I was loosely aware before this piece about just how much antibiotics we've been and the, the long-term impacts of that. Already over 20,000 people a year die from antibiotic resistant diseases. Oh my God. And so whether or not you want to be a vegan or vegetarian, your health and the health of your family has a very powerful vested interest in this issue of factory farming. On our website, people can go and sign a petition to urging senators and congressmen to prohibit the use of antibiotics in farm animals. And that would go a long way towards helping stop this crisis. Gina, do you know what fish is impossible to eat but can give people around the world energy and vitality? I have no idea. Let's watch. My name is Gavin Armstrong, and I'm the founder and CEO of Lucky Iron Fish. Iron deficiency is the world's most common micronutrient issue, negatively impacting the lives of 3.5 billion people, so half of the planet. If you don't have enough iron in your body, you won't be able to produce enough red blood cells or hemoglobin, and this will make you tired, lethargic, prevent your muscles from developing, you'll be more susceptible to other diseases. The Lucky Iron Fish is a simple health innovation to combat iron deficiency. Southeast Asia has some of the highest rates of iron deficiency around the world. And in Cambodia, the symbol of a fish is a symbol of luck. And so we shaped a block of iron like a fish, and everyone thought that by cooking with it, it would make their households lucky. And this can release up to 90% of your daily required iron intake. It's incredible. People say they have more energy, their kids are doing better in schools. So we're really seeing positive impacts of the fish in the communities. And if you buy one for yourself, we give one away for free to an NGO or hospital in a developing country. It's our goal to put a fish in every pot. When things are not going well at the economy, we have one of our presidents saying, like, go out and shop. And like, that is just looty tunes. Toes. Noses. Hormones know too. Dogs know. Kids know. Kids who think their dogs know. <laughs> Scott, it's good out here. Buy a fancy car, a big house, fill it with as much amazing stuff as possible. Right? That's the American dream, right? Consumerism will set you free. Interestingly enough, though, we found that you might not always be responsible for those impulse buys. There might actually be outside forces at work making you buy the things that you do. <laughs> Check it out. This is Black Friday in Manhattan, and crazy guy with the bullhorn is Reverend Billy, an anti-shopping activist who crashed this annual buying bacchanal to rail against the sins of consumerism. This woman has stopped shopping today! You can too! As Americans, we love to shop. Living to excess equals success. And these days, we're buying more than ever. We have more stuff than ever before. Are we happier? I mean, more stuff than any generation before us. By every measurement that we have, we're less happy than we have been in the past because products in and of themselves don't bring happiness. To find out why we have this primal urge to buy stuff that doesn't make us happy, 
I've come to the neuroscience lab at Yale University. They're gonna scan my brain. You need to take off all the metals. The mic will have to go. This will be the last you hear of me. While scanning my brain using an MRI, Professor Levy will run a shopping test on me. Different items appear on a screen and I'll decide how much money I would spend on each one. Professor Levy is a neuroscientist making discoveries in a remarkable new field called neuroeconomics. What you see here is the medial prefrontal cortex where we usually see representation of value, how you represent value of different things. So this is my brain on uh -huh. shopping. Exactly. So these are the what you call the pleasure areas of the brain. We call it value, but you can think about it as the enjoyment that you get out of these things. So that's real then, the idea of something like retail therapy, where you could really experience that kind of both pleasure and then also perhaps get addicted to that type of experience. Absolutely, absolutely. You see them in addiction to substances or you see them in obesity. These are the uh, same centers. These are the same brain same areas. areas, yes. Our brain addiction to shopping might help explain scenes like these. Like junkies craving the next hit. Even when you don't need to make choices, you just see everything that is presented to you on commercials or on the street or everywhere, these areas are active and they encode the value of whatever you see. It means that if you want to convince someone to buy something, you can do a lot of things to increase activation in these areas. Whether we realize it or not, there is this existing construct that we all play into. So we're born so that we can go to school, we go to school to get good grades, get good grades to get into a good college, get a great job so you can make lots of money, and you make lots of money so you can buy really cool stuff, and finally you buy all this really cool stuff so you can die. Problem is that at the end of that, there's nothing else. I'm gonna go speak with a guy who got off the make money to buy stuff hamster wheel. Thanks to the sale of an internet startup, Graham Hill was made a millionaire several times over. Young and rich, he went on extravagant vacations, bought nice houses, and filled them with fancy things. It just didn't work for me. It just ended up being a, a ton of management, and it just felt like wasteful. And so cut to now, I'm currently renovating a 350 square foot home, and I'm very happy about it. To practice what he preaches, Graham started an architectural consulting firm called Life Edited. They find ways for you to downsize your home and hopefully live life a little happier. You realize how much society is pushing us towards consumerism. I mean, to the point where when things are not going well with the economy, we have one of our presidents saying, like, go out and shop. And like, that is just Looney Tunes. <laughs> We want transformation. If you can take one space, transform it easily, then you're getting more out of that space. And by doing that, you have less space to fill with stuff. It just makes your whole life smaller, greener, and happier. Graham found his secret to happiness and is now sharing it with others. But what about me? I have a few guilty shopping pleasures. Well, I'm told Reverend Billy offers a more spiritual cure for consumption. Does your wallet need an exorcism, Seth? Talk to me. Um, yeah, yeah, all right. Oh, Seth. <laughs> Sin coming out of this, streaming out of your wallet. What have you been buying? <laughs> Earth, hallelujah. May the force of life come into this wallet and erase its magnetic strip. Of all the credits, you can't buy anything now, Seth. <laughs> How do you feel? I feel good. It worked. He can't buy anything now. He's cured. Can you walk? Oh, I can walk. Uh, okay. Can you run? I can run. He's cured. It's so much about the aspirational lifestyle, right? It's, I want to be prettier, I want to be famous, I want to be in a private jet with Brad Pitt, and if I buy this handbag, then maybe I'll have that lifestyle. And the interesting thing, too, is that there's so many people who have such a vested interest in you going out and buying. But I've read the key is the endorphin release. 
Like they've also shown that when you check your phone, your email, you have a new email, you get like a little hit of endorphin, like a little drug. Like they, they try and engineer this into shopping, right? Absolutely. I mean, so we're saying make a vow to downsize one aspect of your life and then take pictures of it and share it with us on social media using the hashtag less is more. Throwing my shoes off. <laughs> so Philippe, you're an environmentalist. You like the forest, right? Okay. Uh, you know, they're all right, but they do a, they do a decent job for us. <laughs> yeah, and so definitely. imagine the fact that a, a huge chunk of the forest, almost the size of Germany, has been wiped out, yeah. right? And that's in large part to illegal logging. Every year. Every year. And so for me, a lot of what I try to figure out is like, what can I actually do? This is one thing. My name is Topher White, founder of Rainforest Connection. We take old cell phones and we use them to fight deforestation. The removal of trees from our planet actually has a greater effect on climate change than all the world's transportation put together. All the world's cars, planes, trucks, ships don't actually add up to the carbon footprint of deforestation. There are a lot of people who are actually trying to keep the forest safe, but one of the biggest problems for them is knowing where the illegal activity is taking place. So we're trying to build a system that allows uh, the people there and us to know what's happening in the forest at all times. It all starts with the cell phone, that thing that we have hundreds of millions of that we throw away every year. It sits up there in the trees in a box to protect it. And then we have some special solar panels that we install around the box. And that's the core of the entire device. They listen to all the sounds of the forest. And when they pick up the sounds of chainsaws, uh, motorcycles, logging trucks, they'll send a real-time alert over the cell phone network to local authorities who can actually show up and catch the perpetrators. Everybody has an old cell phone in the drawer. Send us yours. We'll put it up in the trees, protect the forest. The point is that there's a tremendous amount of bad that can go on when you turn the lights out. The trick is to just try to keep the lights on. That's a good looking pile of dirt. Yeah, it's nature's care. What's in it? Lots of rich, moist, organic things. Can I touch it? Yeah, get in there. That feels really good. Nature's Care Organic Garden Soil. That's some good dirt. And that's some other good stuff, too. The people who are doing most of the fighting are the government of Khartoum killing innocent people. Ant enough? Mm -hmm. And that's an office coming in, so we're going to go to the caves. Okay, we're moving. We're going. We're going. Come yeah, on. Come on. Va a haber gente que va a decir que que no te mereces tener un certificado de nacimiento para tus hijos. ¿Y qué les dices a esas personas? He said, I don't care if people are going to bully me or whatever. You want to be your true self? You have to show your true feelings. What is the show about? It's about inspiring other people to aspire. 